we're back here and we're going to talk about the GI and hepatic infections. So the major infections of the GI system primarily pertain to foodborne illnesses and acute diarrhea. And in the gastroenterology section, I gave an entire long talk to diarrhea. So um, most of the infectious diarrhea that you need to know is, as far as infectious causes in the GI system, infectious disease in the GI system, it's all in that section. So we're just going to give it a brief overview, but uh, if you're interested in infectious disease of the GI system, go to the, uh, to the diarrhea uh, review of uh, the gastroenterology sections. Okay, so all patients with acute diarrhea should be carefully evaluated for volume status as soon as they come in, particularly older patients who might not be able to get to the sink to get water. Uh, so in general, any patient that comes in complaining about diarrhea, it's a good idea to give them half a liter of normal saline just because most of them are going to be somewhat uh, dehydrated. Obviously, the uh, contraindications such as uh, renal issues uh, are withstanding. So if, if they have renal issues and, and such uh, like, then, then don't necessarily bolus them. But for the vast majority of patients, if they've got acute diarrhea, you're going to want to start out bolusing them because fluid administration is important uh, as far as volume resuscitation. Okay, uh, the first question when a patient has acute diarrhea is, is it bloody? And generally a patient will tell you if it's bloody or not. So uh, if the patient has bloody diarrhea, it's a whole different list of pathogens than if it's not bloody. And usually when a patient has diarrhea, the best first diagnostic step is going to be stool studies because as far as uh, finding out if the uh, as far as finding out if the stool is bloody, we can look for white and red blood cells uh, on uh, with with laboratory examination. Fecal fat is going to be good to look for malabsorption uh, to see if that's a cause of the diarrhea. Uh, we don't necessarily know if it's infectious right off the bat. Ova and parasites will be uh, good to have. Uh, to look for any kind of parasitic causes. Now I will say that as long as there are red blood cells in the diarrhea, most of the time that's going to mean that there are white blood cells in the diarrhea. So a bloody diarrhea as far as red diarrhea mean, generally means it's an infectious cause. So if there's red blood cells, there's generally white blood cells. The most accurate test for uh, finding out an infectious diarrhea is a stool culture. Of course, that's going to take some time. So if the diarrhea is bloody, and by bloody we mean a positive lactoferrin. Now remember lactoferrin tests for white blood cells, but that's going to be uh, a, a sign of inflammation. Like I said, generally where there's white blood cells, there's also red blood cells and, and, and vice versa. So positive lactoferrin on your stool study uh, or grossly bloody diarrhea, um, these are the causes. Uh, salmonella and shigella are the two most common causes, salmonella being associated with poultry and eggs. Campylobacter is another common cause uh, that you should know is associated with the development later on of Guillain-Barre syndrome as a post-infectious sequela. Uh, Yersinia doesn't really have any any associations really. Uh, e. coli is associated with the development of hemolytic uremic syndrome, so that would be a drop in uh, thrombocytes, a, an increase in, uh, in creatinine, um, and so uh, these patients definitely make sure not to transfuse them with platelets. Entamoeba histolytica is another cause of bloody diarrhea. This would give you a positive ova and parasites on stool studies. Vibrio vulnificus and Vibrio perihemolyticus are both associated with shellfish consumption. Vib uh, Vibrio vulnificus uh, is associated with uh, liver dysfunction and with certain skin findings that we're going to see in a little bit. So here's a Vibrio vulnificus skin manifestation. Clearly this is, uh, this is not normal. Uh, these are bullae, uh, raised blisters. So what happens is that uh, the, the actual organism uh, 
uh, causes skin breakdown. It separates the skin and that causes the blister. So here on the left we have, uh, we have uh, intact bullae and here on the upper right we have some intact like up here and some that have bursted and then here we have bursted bullae. Okay, so the non-bloody diarrhea, uh, the causes of that are predominantly viral. Staph aureus is another cause which is associated with dairy products. Bacillus cereus is associated with re heated fried rice. Giardiasis, Giardia lambia is going to be uh, give you a positive ova and parasites. It's the general trend now that rather than do an ova and parasites, we do a Giardia antigen when we suspect Giardia lamblia. So uh, you may see it on the USMLE as positive ova and parasites or positive Giardia antigen. Obviously, the Giardia antigen test is more accurate. So uh, if you have a choice, do the Giardia antigen rather than the ova and parasites. This is associated with campers and oral anal sexual contact. This is spread by the oral anal route, and so obviously if there's fecal matter in the uh, streams, that's how campers contract Giardia. Cryptosporidium is associated with HIV patients, particularly patients that are progressed into AIDS with CD4 counts that are less than 100 to 200, so very progressed AIDS. And this is diagnosed with a uh, positive modified acid fast stain. And then the scombroid reaction. Now this is actually not an infectious disease, but it is caused from a bacteria inside the fish. So uh, this is associated with fish, particularly large fish, tuna, mackerel, etc. And what happens is that when the fish is left out over uh, time, the histidine in the fish gets converted into histamine and you intake all that histamine and it causes uh, rash and itching and, uh, and so that's the scombroid reaction which is a foodborne disease caused by a pathogen but it is not actually an infectious disease of the GI tract. This is a scombroid reaction here. Uh, it just looks like a general hives. Okay, so as far as treating infectious diarrhea, uh, infectious diarrhea tends to be self-limited. So in young, healthy patients, usually you can keep an eye on this. Uh, I would admit most patients who are having uh, frank, bloody diarrhea, but uh, if they're healthy, you can, dis uh, you can discharge them home and just make sure that they're getting adequate hydration and electrolytes. Uh, Gatorade, Pedialyte are far superior to water. Very ill patients, elderly patients, patients with concomitant diseases, and any patient that uh, you don't think would be able to support themselves at home should be admitted, and antibiotics can be used. Uh, we would generally use ciprofloxacin as that's active against most infectious diarrhea causes. There are specific treatments based on the pathogen, so if you have an idea uh, on what the specific uh, pathogen might be based on the patient's history or eventually based on the culture, but generally it's going to be based on the history. You can treat them with something else instead of ciprofloxacin, although I would probably add it to ciprofloxacin, but on the USMLE it might want you to uh, give this specific drug uh, that you would use for the specific illness that you're presuming. So if you presume the patient has giardiasis, if they've been outside camping and they've got a uh, they've got diarrhea uh, because they drank water from a stream, or particularly with giardiasis, you can sometimes get fat malabsorption. Then the drug of choice would be flagelmetronidazole. Campylobacter, you would use erythromycin. Cryptosporidiosis. Uh, which would be in the HIV patients. The treatment here is just to ensure that they're uh, on their antiviral, re uh, antiretroviral regimen. Uh, so ensure proper heart. With a scombroid reaction, uh, antihistamines are used uh, as a supportive basis. Okay, so moving on to hepatitis. Hepatitis is a viral infection of the liver parenchyma. So since this is an infection of the liver parenchyma itself, we would expect elevation of the AST and ALT, the liver transaminases. There are five types of hepatitis, but only three that we see most frequently. A, B, and C we see most frequently. 
The best way to remember this is A and E are at the ends. So what are at your, your ends, your mouth, and your anus? So A and E are transmitted oral anal, and anything that's transmitted oral anal can be transmitted foodborne because of people not washing their hands. Any hepatitis can be acute. Only three of them can be chronic. And the chronic kinds are the ones that are spread parenterally. So those are the insides. Parenteral means inside. So B, C, and D are spread parenterally. Generally, we see B and C as the chronic hepatitis. D is only seen in patients that already have a hepatitis B infection. Generally, D and E we don't see on the USMLE because they're so uncommon. But something that's good to remember is that D requires the presence of a hepatitis B infection, hepatitis B infection and E is uh, most notably severe in pregnant women. Hepatitis A and hepatitis B both have effective vaccinations and high-risk groups should be vaccinated. So who are high-risk groups for hepatitis A? Well, since it's a foodborne illness, these will be patients who are travelers, patients who are going to be traveling to a country where perhaps uh, food hygiene is uh, not as good as here in the United States. So travelers should get a hepatitis A vaccination. Hepatitis B vaccination would be good for patients that have put themselves in high-risk scenarios. So patients who are IV drug users, patients who engage in oral anal uh, intercourse, and so forth. All patients with chronic hep uh, hepatitis increase their risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, which is the cancer of the liver. And so that would be hepatitis B, C, or D. So the symptoms of hepatitis, as far as the acute symptoms, would be fever, malaise, just like in any infection infection, right upper quadrant pain, indicating that there's something going on in the liver or biliary tract, weight loss, jaundice, dark urine, and light colored stool. Now, the reason that we have jaundice is because the hepatocytes are spilling out bilirubin into the bloodstream, and when bilirubin gets absorbed into the skin, that's going to cause the skin to turn yellow. You could also add itching to, to that, uh, or pruritus, to uh, to that list of symptoms because when you get bilirubin in your skin, you get histamine release and that causes itching. So the bilirubin being lost into the bloodstream not only causes uh, your jaundice, it's also going to cause a dark urine. Because there's less bilirubin going into the intestine, so you're having bilirubin going into your bloodstream rather than going into your intestines where it should be going, what's going to happen is uh, you're going to get a lighter stool. So less bilirubin going into the intestines means a lighter stool. So that's why we have a dark urine and a light colored stool in hepatic infections. Now the differential diagnosis for infectious hepatitis is going to be alcohol-induced hepatitis. And they can present the same way with the same symptoms. Alcohol can cause an acute uh, necrosis of the hepatocytes, and so it can present the same way as infectious hepatitis. Generally, the rule of thumb is to look at the transaminases. With infectious hepatitis, generally we're going to see the ALT being higher than the AST, and then with alcoholic-induced hepatitis, we're going to see the AST higher than the ALT. But this is just a rule of thumb. So you don't necessarily know, you can't tell just from that. So all patients with jaundice, fever, uh, signs of hepatitis should be getting a hepatitis panel. And this is checking for uh, immunoglobulins and for, uh, for antigens that pertain to the hepatitis A, B, and C viruses. Recent travel is going to raise suspicion for the hepatitis A virus because generally that's contracted outside of the United States. And of course, IV drug use and unprotected sexual contact is going to raise suspicion for hepatitis B and hepatitis C, since those are the means that those viruses are transmitted. So how do we read the hepatitis panel? So we order a hepatitis panel when we suspect a patient may have hepatitis. Right upper quadrant pain, perhaps elevated bilirubin, elevated liver transaminases, scleral icterus, jaundice, light colored stools, dark colored urine, and so forth. Well, hepatitis A and C are pretty easy to read. They only have one or two markers. 
So hepatitis A, it's as easy as reading the anti-HAV IgM. So what that is, is it's the antibody that's produced against hepatitis A. And if there's positive IgM, then it means there is acute disease. Remember, hepatitis A can't be chronic, so you will only have acute antibodies. And IgM are your acute antibodies. IgG are your chronic antibodies. So there's only IgM for hepatitis A, and if it's positive, that will give you the diagnosis of hepatitis A. For hepatitis C, if you have positive IgM for hepatitis C, that will represent an acute disease. If you have positive IgG for hepatitis C, that would represent a chronic disease. You can also get the PCR RNA levels uh, for hepatitis C, and that represents the amount of virus in the patient's system. So their infectivity, it also represents basically their viral load overall. Okay, so hepatitis B, B is a little bit more difficult. There are actually, I put four markers are red. There's actually really five markers that are red. So let's talk about what each of these things are in general before we talk about how they're red. So hepatitis B surface antigen. So remember, antigen is a protein on the actual virus. So the surface antigen on hepatitis B, hepatitis B has a surface and it has a core, Hepatitis B surface antigen is the protein that sits on the periphery of the virus. So uh, hepatitis B surface antigen is the protein on the surface of the hepatitis B virus. Hepatitis B uh, E antigen is a protein inside the hepatitis B virus. And generally we're going to associate hepatitis B E antigen as a level of infectivity, sort of how we associated hepatitis uh, C PCR RNA level as a level of infectivity with hepatitis C. Now getting into antibodies, so what we produce in response to these foreign antigens, the hepatitis B core antibody, uh, IgM, is the early antibody made to the proteins inside the hepatitis B virus. Now let's think here for a minute. When you get a vaccination, what are you getting? You are getting the surface antibodies. You're getting a form of the surface antibody. It's not really, uh, sorry, surface antigen. It's not the real surface antigen, but it's something that will allow you pr to produce surface antibodies. So never, ever, ever, ever should you ever have core antibodies if you don't have hepatitis B. Okay, core antibodies are only present in a patient who has actually been infected with hepatitis B. A patient who's been immunized to hepatitis B will be positive for the surface antibody because they've been giving, given a form of the surface antigen, but they haven't been given anything that looks like the core antigen. So those are only positive in patients who have actually been infected with uh, hepatitis B. So hepatitis B core antibody, IgM, is the early antibody. IgM is the acute early antibody that's made within six months. The total uh, hepatitis B core antibody, what that really is, it says total hepatitis B core antibody. What that means is the hepatitis B core antibody, IgM, and the hepatitis B core antibody, IgG. IgG is the chronic antibody. That will be positive permanently. And so the total hepatitis B core antibody is referring to both IgG and IgM. Okay, so let's say you get a hepatitis B vaccine. What you're getting is a hepatitis B surface antigen, so the protein that sits on the periphery of the hepatitis B virus you're getting a hepatitis B surface antigen-like protein. It's not the exact same thing, but it's close enough to where you can make antibodies that will fight HPV. So when you get that hepatitis B surface antigen-like protein, within six months, you will begin to form hepatitis B surface antibodies. Note, you're not forming hepatitis B core antibodies because you're not being given the hepatitis B core antigen or anything like it. You're given the hepatitis B surface anti, uh, antigen uh, like protein. So it's similar to the hepatitis B surface antigen. Okay, let's say you get infected 
with HPV. So in the case that you're infected with HPV, you're getting the hepatitis B surface antigen, like uh, you would with a, a, uh, an immunization, but you're also getting the hepatitis B core antigen and the hepatitis E antigen. During the symptomatic stage, so within six months, uh, that's when you're symptomatic, you will be positive for hepatitis B surface antigen. Why? Because you have the antigen in your body. That's from the hepatitis B itself. You will also be positive for hepatitis E antigen. Why? Because that also comes from the hepatitis B. Now, as far as antibodies, you're going to be positive for IgM, but you're not necessarily going to be positive for IgG yet. So what happens is that you develop hepatitis B core antibody IgM in response to the hepatitis core antigen. The total hepatitis core antibody will be positive because you have hepatitis B core antibody IgM. The hepatitis B surface antibody, however, has not formed yet because it takes approximately six months for that to develop. Okay, now some patients do actually go on to clear their hepatitis B. Uh, I believe the number approximately is, uh, let's see, I have it written down here, about 5 to 10 percent go on to chronicity. So the vast majority of patients do go on to clear their hepatitis B. So let's say that they clear their hepatitis B infection. As far as the hepatitis B surface antigen, they will develop the hepatitis B surface antibody as if they were immunized, but the hepatitis B surface antigen is cleared because they have cleared their infection. They no longer have viruses around. The hepatitis E antigen is negative as well because that's part of the active virus. The hepatitis B IgM antibody is going to be negative. Why? Because that's the acute response. So that's gonna be negative but they will have a positive hepatitis B uh, core antibody, a total hepatitis B core antibody that's positive because they have hepatitis B core antibody IgG. And that's a marker of their chronic, or of their past infection. So it means they had the infection a long time ago. So for the rest of these people's lives, they will carry a marker of their previous HBV infection. And what that is, is hepatitis B core antibody IgG. They will be IgM negative, just like anybody else. And unlike patients who are infected with hepatitis B actively. So unlike the patients that have immunizations, these patients do have a, a core or an antibody to a core protein and it's an IgG antibody. And they will also have an antibody to the surface protein. Now, if you don't clear your H or your hepatitis B uh, infection, what's going to happen is that the hepatitis B surface antigen persists. So your, H your immune system is not able to clear the hepatitis B virus. And so the hepatitis B surface antigen is going to persist because that's part of hepatitis B. So these patients will be positive for hepatitis B surface antigen, just like a patient with active acute hepatitis. The hepatitis E antigen can be positive or negative depending on their uh, infectivity, depending on their stage. It can go up and down throughout the course of their disease. The hepatitis B core antibody IgM will be negative because they're progressed more, they're, they're more than six months into their illness. And so IgM is really just an acute response, as we mentioned. It's, it's, not, it's not something that persists. Their total hepatitis B core antibody will be positive because they do form IgM, or sorry, IgG, and their hepatitis B surface antibody will be positive. Basically, the way you distinguish a patient who has developed chronic hepatitis from a patient who uh, clears their hepatitis is whether or not they have uh, hepatitis B surface antigen six months after their initial infection. So if a patient develops hepatitis B 
and after six months they're negative for surface antigen, then they've cleared their infection. If they, uh, after six months, they still per persist to have hepatitis B surface antigen, then you can consider that to be chronic hepatitis B. So going back to just general hepatitis. So the treatment for acute hepatitis is going to be just uh, supportive care. So we'll treat their nausea and vomiting. Uh, we'll treat their fluid status. And basically we're just doing what we need to do uh, supportively uh, for the one or two weeks that they have the acute hepatitis uh, and then uh, monitoring them with follow-up to make sure that they're not going into chronic hepatitis. And most patients will not go, actually the vast majority of patients will not go into the chronic hepatitis stage. They, their immune system will clear the hepatitis virus out. Now, on the other hand, if they do go into chronic hepatitis, and you'll know this based on your serologies, then the treatment is going to depend on the type of hepatitis they have. So if they have hepatitis B, we can choose one of a few routes. So we can use interferon alpha, which we can use both for hepatitis B, and we do always use for hepatitis C. Uh, for hepatitis B, we can also use entecavir, uh, adefavir, and then lamivudine. And you might recognize lamivudine uh, as an HIV medication, and indeed it is a nucleoside analog reverse transcriptase inhibitor. So uh, interferon alpha, entecavir, adefavir, or lamivudine. We don't use all four. We can just use one or the other. Uh, all of these are acceptable therapies. We also want to do long-term follow-up and monitoring. We want to check their liver functions. We also want to do sonogram uh, every so often uh, because these patients are at elevated risk for hepatocellular carcinoma. If they have hepatitis C, then we're going to use interferon alpha and ribavirin. So interferon alpha and ribavirin for hepatitis C. We use both of them. And then we're also going to do the long-term monitoring, get the liver function tests, do the sonogram every so often, and uh, to just to make sure that they're not developing a tumor. So the adverse effects of these drugs you should be aware of. So interferon alpha, uh, remember that interferon is what is released when you have certain viral infections, such as the flu. And this is actually what gives you that sort of myalgia sick feeling when you have the flu. Like, I, I don't know if you've ever had the flu and, you know, you just don't want anybody to touch you because you're just achy and crabby. That is interferon alpha working its magic in your body. Ribavirin can cause a red cell anemia, so keep an eye out for that. The only definitive cure for, uh, for hepatitis is going to be a transplantation. So once they're in the chronic hepatitis stage, they uh, then um, if they do have declining liver function and, and, and they're starting to, uh, their clinical status is starting to decline in uh, end stage hepatitis, you can get them on, a li on the list for transplantation. Uh, so uh, that is the only definitive cure. Otherwise, we use these antivirals and interferon.